Welcome to Fret Buzz the Podcast. My name is Joe McMurray. And I am Aaron Sefchik. And today we have a very special guest calling in from Europe. I think you're in Austria, is that right? Yep. We've got Adam Rafferty. Um, he's a funky fingerstyle guitarist from New York City. Um, he has studywithadam.com and what's the other website? Adam Rafferty. Adam Rafferty.com, yeah. You might have heard his covers of uh, Michael Jackson tunes or Stevie Wonder tunes, all played on uh, acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. I've actually been part of his Study With Adam website. I've been taking lessons with him, and we're thrilled to have you on. Oh, man, it's a pleasure to be here, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Austria. So are you touring only in Austria specifically, or are you touring all over Europe? I tour anywhere where I'm invited to tour, <laughs> that you know, fair enough. <laughs> basically, uh, but like as, you know, typical traveling musician story, you know, fell in love and got stuck in Austria, you know, so, but uh, mo I'd say 80% of my concerts are in Germany. Okay. Which is, you know, it's, it's a healthy train ride, but it's, it's the next country over. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you have connections in Germany that brought you there, or do they happen to be the most receptive to your style of music, or what is it about Germany? I did start out uh, having had, I started touring in 98 or 97 with a jazz trio when I was just a straight up jazz bebop guy playing an arch top guitar, and I toured with a trio. And I started in Austria because I got I became friends with an Austrian drummer who said, hey, I, I think I can book us a couple gigs. And of course, that was delightful because everything was delegated to him. I just showed up and played. And then uh, people changed in the group and somehow it, it started taking hold in Germany. That seemed to be a place it, they, they really uh, they really value uh, live music in Germany and, and they I don't know. It's just I seemed to somehow be invited there, you know, and, and one one gig led to the next. And so it just it just grew. And there's there's a whole little touring circuit. You know, once you get on a train, there's another gig two hours away. There's another gig three hours away. And it just it it sort of builds. And so when I switched over to solo guitar, I thought, oh, geez, I'm going to have to start from the from the beginning again. But a lot of the same places said, oh, wow, we'd love to have you. And so it was a combination of I had some connections. I got I was already started there, and then all the other solo guitar guys on the scene. It's it's a community. So you know you've got guys like Michael Fix. There's this guy named Peter Finger who has this big company called Acoustic Music in Osnabrück, Germany. It's like a CD. Uh, well, I mean not that CDs are really sort of a thing but he was putting out cds and dvds like a big big acoustic guitar record company and so it, it turns out that everybody's everybody's kind of looking out for everybody else and there's places that do solo guitar and they say oh great you're coming through we'd love to have you and so it, it was just easy you know it's mm. just easy i've done my one-off gigs here in france and and Bermuda and a little few things in Russia and Kazakhstan, but Germany is always the place that I can really string a bunch of gigs together and make a nice tour. Fair enough. Do you speak German? Actually, I do. Uh, my my grandmother was from Vienna, and so my grandmother and mother spoke Austrian and German at home, and I I understood when I was growing up, but I I was never good at speaking it. In fact, I never tried. I just felt kind of gummed up and embarrassed trying to speak German but you know it helps with the communication I mean everybody here speaks English when they have to and between my German and their English it's it's cool and it actually really it helps the whole being on stage and rapping to the audience because a lot of the older people who didn't get quite the same education as the younger people they're just sort of looking at musicians when they speak English and nodding and pretending they understand when they don't. So it, it helps the, it helps the sort of rapping to the audience on stage. So it's, yeah. it's good. Awesome. How often do you get back to New York city? Not often enough. Uh, I had been going, the move moving over here was sort of a one, one living location kind of, airbrush faded into the other 
And I had been going back to New York quite a bit because I had my apartment there. And my mother in you know pre-2014 was pretty ill. So a tour went in and I'd say, geez, I just got to go back and, and check up on her. And, you know, so there was a lot of back and forth. It was still sort of like I was on tour, bouncing back and forth. And in 2014, she passed away. Mm-hmm. And sorry. Well, that's totally, that's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm glad she's not suffering anymore. And, uh, and so a year went by and I just went, oh man, I haven't been back to New York in a year. There was, there was so much less reason to go back. I mean, my dad's there and I'll go like on the holidays, but I realized I was just paying for an apartment over there. And while it would be super cool to just have a New York pad, I was unable to uh, rent that out due to the laws in the building. So I just ended up kind of tipping the scales ever more to here. And then of course, you know, things get more official when you, when you hang out in Europe long enough, you got to get your insurance here and you got to do all, you know, all the biz stuff then has to be here and be compliant and, and all that. You can't, you can't say you're on tour and just visiting after six years, you know, they go, we don't think so. You know, so, so I don't get back often enough. That's the mm-hmm. long, long answer. We had a guest on, um, he's a jazz drummer in New York city. Um, can't remember the episode number. What's but, his name? Um, Graham Doby. Don't know. He's, he's a younger guy like mm-hmm. me, but um, he was telling us about the New York scene. And um, did you find that you weren't able to get enough gigs in New York City itself, and that's why you started heading over to Europe? You know, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, what was he saying? What was what was Graham saying though about about the scene there? I mean, the thing that everybody, you know, people knew each other and, you know, there was a community, but there were a lot of pay to play kind of gigs and, um, yeah. you and know, he, the money wasn't there necessarily. And he, the way, the role that he kind of takes is he's the one who's the curator. He's actually putting together all these gigs and he seems to be a, a predominant role, you know, in terms of oh, getting, wow. getting people together and, and, and creating events. So I, I think he's kind of making it happen, um, which is. Oh, wow. Cool. Well, that's, that's interesting to be sort of the, the guy who's, who's running something that mm. that's, that's interesting. Um, my situation was, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a cool story, kind of a bizarro story. Um, I was just, you know, I didn't live off gigs in New York. It was a combination of gigs and teaching a lot of guitar in music schools. And uh, I tried to run a jazz wedding band, which was not really successful. It's sort of like the selling ice to Eskimos problem because most <laughs> most married people, most people getting married want DJs and, and the typical top 40 band. But, you know, we, I tried to hustle the angle of, well, if you want something sophisticated, but only a few people a year wanted that. So it sort of limped along and a lot of the, you know, as a jazz guitar player, I, I feel very poignant about the, the whole jazz thing. And I'm still psychically really connected to um, a lot of the people that I was connected with. I think about them all the time. My mentor, Mike Longo, who was Dizzy Gillespie's pianist, you know, he and I, we haven't, we don't really speak that much anymore, but he was like a father to me. I mean, it was like a really heavy uh, mentor apprentice kind of relationship as far, as far as I'm concerned, it was, it was really heavyweight. I mean, it was 20 years of on the phone three times every day and, you know, just going through life and, and, and he, by way of him, I came into contact with, like the jazz scene of New York, not all the guys who are famous because there's so, there's so many, but you know, I, I, I'm watching old Duke Ellington videos and I'm going, Oh my God, I've played with guys who were in Duke Ellington's band. Right. You know, like that, like I, I was really plugged into this whole thing and it, and it informed how I play. So I'm, I still feel like a jazz musician even though it, I don't show that side very much. Anyway, uh, regarding the gigs in New York, 
you know, being a jazz guitarist, I was thinking, well, man, I just want to like solo and get my chops up and like go crazy over chord changes. And I found that I found that a lot of the gigs were I had to function really well. I had to be able to back up a singer. I had to be able to play it. One of my longest gigs, it was a fun gig, was a duo with a saxophone player a couple nights a week in a restaurant and like just making that gig work and making the music groove and, and keeping people happy, but not being too loud. And I mean, that, that gig helped pay the rent. Uh, there was a short period way back that I played in Harlem with a lot of the organ groups, but there was only one steady gig that I could sort of rely on. Mm. And that was, that was short lived because the band leader was just a terrible alcoholic and, and everything. It was great experience, but you know, you can't really hang with that more than six months. So, there, there was this sort of dissatisfaction that I was feeling because even though I was putting out CDs and like barely getting a group on tour in Europe, I could never really get gigs where like I could showcase myself and play jazz guitar and like solo over chord changes because you got to realize a guy like George Benson, he's amazing, but he's George Benson because he sings, mm. you know, and you also got to think Pat Metheny is first, he's invented his own language and he has paid the ultimate price for being on tour. I mean, he's absolutely lived his, his music and like from, from what other people have told me, you know, he's just road dog. And so it was very hard as a straight ahead kind of bebopper guy who didn't sing and didn't really play weird stuff like either scope not weird but i should say more modern like a schofield or mike stern or, or pat Matheny. i wasn't really on that edge i just wanted to play like nice jazz standards you know and so i couldn't i couldn't really get <laughs> I, I couldn't really fire things up no matter how hard i tried and i had a tour in europe it was the final tour that I did with where I was the band leader of a group. And I realized it's just too strenuous. There, there wasn't enough money to pay everybody and pay for the travel. We were all, it was just so thin. I, I couldn't keep the group together, you know, and it was, it was, and this was all before YouTube. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, that's important to, to realize this was like, you had a website and you, you called the club. I would go, I mean, this is some old school stuff for you, Joe. I would go to the post office with CDs in envelopes and have to fill out customs forms just so they knew I existed mm -hmm. and then follow up with phone calls and faxes because a lot of clubs didn't even have email. Yeah. And so suddenly it was like within a year I said, Oh geez, you know, I just, I don't have the energy to keep pounding the pavement like this. You know, I just, so I laid low. I, I played as a side man with a few other people. YouTube comes along and I saw Tommy Emanuel. Somebody said, man, did you ever hear of Tommy Emanuel? And I, I mean, I think he's changed all of our perceptions about solo guitar. So I used to think solo guitar had to be like Julian Bream or Segovia or Joe Pass hmm. or like, Leo Kotke, which at the time I couldn't really get with. I was just like, that's weird. Or, well, Chet Atkins, well, that's not really my thing. I grew up in New York. You know, it didn't, it didn't really get under my skin. Yeah. And then I saw Tommy. I'm like going, man, one man power show on guitar. And within about a minute of watching him, it was the Sheldon Hall DVD. I said, I want to do that, but with my own repertoire. I can take jazzy stuff. I can take the tunes that I grew up on. And if that guy can do it, I can do it. Well, not, not so easy because he is kind of a freak uh, <laughs> in terms of his skill. And he practices like a maniac still. But that was, that was the idea. And I started just fooling around with uh, a few Stevie Wonder songs. I Wish was actually the first one because that was cool. Because it, well, it's so hard, I, I stopped playing it, you know, because well, that's another story. I've, I've temporarily stopped playing it. So I messed with that one. That was the first one. And then I used I used Tommy as a model. I'd be like, well, if he has a fast one, I'm going to do a fast one. Oh, I see he's doing a ballad like this. I'm going to pick something different, but I'm going to do a ballad. Oh, wow. He's, and I looked at how he mixed up his show. And 
Next thing you know, man, I put I wish up on YouTube. I think that was the first or second one. Mm. And the reaction was like, all of a sudden it was like the gates of heaven opened up. You know, I thought I was a genius or something, you know, cause like, but it was more of a luck thing and a timing thing. It was, it was just the right thing at the right time. And then with superstition, it, it caught fire. Yeah. I actually, and I actually did a little digging on your YouTube channel. Uh -huh. right? You got 67,000 followers. Uh huh. I wish it would grow already. I want a hundred thousand, but hey, you know. It, it, you got 19 million views. That's pretty good. And you started in July of 07, which is that's like like you said, that's pretty much the beginning of of it all, which is great. Andy McKee had just kind of gotten in there. Yeah. And you know, uh, so there was Tommy was up there, Andy McKee was up there, little Sung Ha Young was up there. Mm. You could see videos. I, I was checking out Doyle Dykes. That was another direction mm -hmm. of playing that I really liked. The and more and, natural style. Well, and yeah, and with the fingernails and the clean, because I studied classical and I played with fingernails. And when I started, I thought, I thought, do I want to go that route? And I was checking out Tommy and I thought, I don't want to be on tour and break nails. So I just made a commitment to how I play for better or for worse. I, I just wanted it to be easier maintenance. Although yesterday during my gig, I don't have nails, but I had uh -huh. part of my callus um, pulled off <laughs> oh. in the middle of a I was playing, <laughs> I was playing something and I, I, it like started catching on the string every time. Oh. And I was like, oh no. And I started trying to not use crazy, the crazy glue. You could put it right on your skin and, and a fine sandpaper file. Just smooth it down. Yeah. yeah. Like, like you would do a nail, just do it on your skin. Yeah. I think I just played so much yesterday morning. My fingers were. Tender. So you did a gig yesterday. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I've Excellent. Cool. Played this weekend. Cool. So, Great. I've been playing some of your uh, some of your arrangements. Excellent, man. Excellent. I love them. But anyway, cool. you're talking about fingernails and yeah. Well, but that so basically it was uh, that period was an incredibly inspiring period. You know, I had I had just moved into a new apartment in New York City, and it was like I discovered this whole world. It, it was such a relief to feel some fresh air um, musically and not be in this pressure cooker of New York. It was like, oh my God, I just finally peaked outside New York City. And I, you know, I had a lot of friends who were touring, doing other stuff. And I, I was like this rat in the maze in, in New York doing little gigs. And I was like, man, how can I get something going on like more worldwide? And, and that just did it. And for better or for worse, I mean, because I played jazz, I love jazz, I was into classical music. I, I, for me, playing cover tunes was like a fish finally getting thrown back into the, the water. Or the, a, a better better example would be like, it would, it, like a, a thirsty person who finally gets something to drink. You know, it was like, man, I'm finally doing something that the audience can get that like I can connect with them because it's funny, you know, like I know Don Ross and some of the more like serious guys, and they're more like, man, I don't know, know why people do cover tunes and, you know, you got to compose and you got to do your original thing. And it, it all has to do with how you came up. It's like I was playing old jazz standards and wondering why people would talk through them like they were a cocktail hour. And finally I do something like Ain't No Sunshine and people are like, Dude, that was amazing, and and I said, "Oh my God, what a, what a this is my um, currency. This is the way that I can communicate with people yeah. with with these tunes that they know and and I understand now the, the cover tune thing. So a whole a whole new thing opened up due to due to YouTube. Yeah, it's interesting yeah. to say that about like I. I studied jazz too, and I'm mm -hmm. I struggle with this idea that the modern population doesn't understand it, doesn't respect it, and so mm -hmm. I've I've said this at least a couple times in the podcast, but I <laughs> I do try to play jazz tunes out, and mm -hmm. I try to I try to present them in a modern way, mm -hmm. whether it's the groove behind it or, you know, it's like your your version of Misty is. I love that version, but when I do it normally with my electric rig and my looping pedal, I'll put like a an R and B groove behind it. Cool, very, very upbeat. Like like uh, I think uh, 
not Schofield. Uh, uh, there, I've seen some other videos of people doing it, but it, I try to do it really upbeat and exciting with a very clear drum beat so people can kind of, mm -hmm. you know, kind of dance with it. And uh, <laughs> I feel like the bebop or older jazz drumming and jazz bass playing is not conducive to the modern audience kind of dancing. They're they're used to this very simple boots and cats and boots and cats and boots oh yeah. And cats. <laughs> I heard it. the the beat that I know is baboons and pizza. Okay. Do that one. Pizza baboons and pizza baboons. <laughs> oh, that's great. I like it. Um, it's like your baboon yeah. bat boot. Hey, you know, it's all it's it's very relative. I was one of the things that I go for in my playing, Joe, and and you know this from the site, and it's sometimes I feel that it's a little too soft, or I wish it was more aggressive. But I hear this sound of a jazz group, and I want my thumb to sound a little bit more like a jazz bass, you know, when when possible. That's just more the sound I'm hearing than a, than a clearly picked note. Anyhow, that said, I've been, I've been kind of messing with the version of Satin Doll, the Duke Ellington tune, Satin mm -hmm. Doll. I played it for my girlfriend the other day. I, I said, do you know this tune? And I put on the YouTube version of Duke Ellington, and it was like, she's like, I have never heard that in my life. And so that's the disconnect right there. Even before I play it, it's like she doesn't even know it. Yeah. Whereas if I went to like my best friend's parents, they would not know Adele. They would know Satin Doll. So it, you, you have to know who you're playing for. And, you know, it's also if, if you slip the tune in maybe between other tunes or if you say, hey, this is an old Duke Ellington, you know, Duke Ellington tune, and you can sort of couch it in some in some schmoozing mm -hmm. with the audience, but yeah, I mean, and they can't get with that. The more sophisticated the jazz beat gets, a lot of people can't get with that. If it's if it's a little bit more obvious, like an "Isn't She Lovely" kind of swing, okay, I can get that. I can snap my fingers, but if it starts to get a little bit more wiggly, like a bebop thing, they they can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I I play for a lot of retirement homes. Like mm -hmm. yesterday and the day before, we're both for retirement assisted living homes. Mm -hmm. And uh, even then, depending on the age, they might not want the older jazz tunes. Like some of these, some of them are like more independent living, uh -huh. and they they want more fifties era. They want Elvis. They want stuff like a lot of blues kind of stuff. Older blues. Yeah, um, they do love. They love. Everybody loves Misty. That one, yeah. that one's a hit across all generations. But yeah, you know, I try to play. If I try to play any bebop, they're like, mm, they don't want it. Yeah, <laughs> there's a difference. The, sometimes old people, older people. Oh, I shouldn't say older. I mean, geez, I, I just turned fifty. <laughs> oh, but uh, but uh, uh, for example, my girlfriend's parents. You know, they they want something that's going to fire them up a little bit. They want to hear some Chuck Berry or some Elvis. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear a Cole Porter tune. Yeah. They don't want to hear all the things you are. I mean, maybe Autumn Leaves, like, because they know it as a movie theme, but they're not going to know it from a Miles Davis record, you know? So, yeah, anyhow, the tune choices. So choosing choosing the tunes is is a tricky one. Like, my dad, he, he doesn't know some of the Bill Withers tunes that I play. He doesn't know Lovely Day. That's, that's all... all all of a sudden starting to be specialized again, you know, so choosing the right tunes, if you want to reach the people is important, but also I'd like to add, I, it's for me, when, when I've sort of tried to calculate things and I, you know, get into that, it's just a dingy state of mind. When I say, what would be good for YouTube? What could get me a bunch of clicks? I've been there. <laughs> I've thought about that. You know, and, and you see guys, oh, man, he got a million clicks on. What would be good for me to do? And that's just such a dingy, crappy feeling. And I've even made myself learn some tunes like that. And you know what? They don't stick. It's not something that stays. It's not something that I want to keep playing. Maybe I tricked a few people. But that's, that's not something that really comes from within. And that's, that's something I'm, I'm confronting new levels of that now. Like how many more cover tunes do I want to do? What a, I don't know what's coming next musically, actually. Uh, but, but yeah, I think a lot of the younger generation who's 
totally focused on YouTube. It's just all about, oh, wow, I can do this cover. Oh, Adele has a, or had a new tune. I got to do that right away because, you know, people will see it. And then it's like you get all these sort of covers that are like right at the same level because no one's gone really deep and with a real level of like love for, for the music where they want to uncover a lot of mysteries. It's just quick. Let me get this new version of a cover out. That's, that's a dangerous thing. Cause then it's just creates so much content on YouTube that I, like that's the content that exhausts me and makes me not want to look at videos. Cause I want to see something of quality if I'm going to spend my time and I just go, ah, I'm too tired. I, I can't wade through all this stuff. You know? yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense, but no, yeah, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you. <laughs> I struggle with this too. I'm not, and I'm not tied to the internet. I mm -hmm. just don't enjoy particularly being on social media. I, mm -hmm. you know, my friends, I'd much, much rather call them if I want to mm -hmm. know what's going on in their life. I really absolutely. don't, you know, I don't care to just see what you did today. Even if I, you're like my best friend or my brother That's or whatever. Right. That's right. I, I don't live on the internet. And so I like everything that I read and everything everybody says, and Aaron's always sending me stuff like the social media presence is so important in mm -hmm. the modern business, you know, this modern musical business. And I just, mm -hmm. I want to play. Me, I want to be let, out there playing for people. Let, let me give you guys a, a little, a little tip. You, you probably, you, you're pretty sophisticated. At least you're more sophisticated than I am with the, with the podcast with this whole Google hangout thing. Uh, something that I've done, and this is, you know, your listeners can, or the viewers can check this out. There's a website called Smarter Q, mm -hmm. which does all kinds of social media posting, and it's evergreen. So when you get to the end of what you've loaded, it starts over again. And you can keep loading new stuff in, and it can post, I don't know if it can post to Instagram, but it can post to Facebook and Twitter, and you can set up a whole posting schedule. So You've probably seen Joe. I mean, you've probably also seen that it doesn't maybe look like I'm posting, but there's all kinds of things that you can do to just quasi stay in the conversation without actually being tied to your phone. Because okay. I know it's important. And yeah, yeah, it's called SmarterQ. It's it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool search. And then people comment on it, and then you see their comments, and you might have a few little conversations. But um in matter of fact, it they even have a little add-on in the Chrome browser. So if I spot something that I think would be cool, I can hit the little add on button and it says, which profiles do you want to post this to and under which categories? So if I spot a new guitar video, I, I post other people's guitar videos. And so that's a nifty little tool to prevent exactly what you're saying, because I don't really want to be on social media uh, as involved. Of course, it's doubly ironic if the people I'm posting to don't want to be involved with it, that it's just, you know, like this echo chamber of me not really talking and people not really listening, but that's maybe what it's going to come to. Um, we listen, I listen to your stuff. Oh, thanks. I, I haven't been writing. I haven't been writing much for the blog. And that's another thing, you know, I, ha I actually have a, I'll be honest about this because I, I think it's interesting. I have a coach, a really cool coach who's helping me get, get my strategy with study with Adam out there. You know, I mean, the teaching is the teaching. That's, that's what I do. But, you know, he'll, he'll say, man, try this, do this, do this. And there are a lot of people, teachers particularly, who like flood the internet with guitar lessons. And I have to be really inspired to do a lesson, which maybe is, maybe is a, a weak point. You know, guys will just get on there and teach anything and say anything and, how to hold a guitar pick and like again that just feels like spam it feels so spammy to me it's like uh, <laughs> you know is that is that what i want my time to be spent doing but i don't know maybe that's what has to I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the deal right now at least i don't know it makes it hard to i mean there's there's so much free content it makes it hard to like what's the point of posting this there's already like 20 videos of people showing you how to do this that you got to yeah. have a different angle or go deeper well I, than I, the average video yeah I, I hear what i hear what you're saying and and i do on one hand i do agree with you that it, it it's and i've said this as well multiple times not so much to the subject but it is an oversaturated market 
I mean, like you said, Adam, there are so many people out there, videos that show you how to play the pentatonic scale or play, you know, a one, five, six, four progression or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and you kind of sit there going to yourself, really, do I, do I want to do this? Is, mm -hmm. this? is this something that I want to take up my time doing? Mm -hmm. uh, because there are so many videos out there that are doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that, you know, maybe I could be spending my time a little bit better because um, I may have, a, and like you had said, I want to be able to, to be inspired to put out a video that is very unique to me. Mm -hmm. um, but also on the other hand of that, Joe, is, is that, people even though there are let's say a thousand videos out there showing you how to play the pentatonic scale there is this um in the, in the year 2019 um whether it's youtube or any facebook or any one of these big big guys that you're playing with the big thing going into the future into 2019 and 2020 is video um all platforms are really pushing this video so um why they're doing that is because it, there's a story there's a story behind every single person out there and your fans your followers um whether you're talking about a pentatonic scale or some complex idea you have people who are invested in who you are as a brand. That's the point. Yes. And yeah. they, they, yes, they could go to Joe Schmo over here playing the pentatonic scale, but they'd rather watch you do it and your explanation of it because they're invested in who you are as a brand, your mm -hmm. story. They want to find out how you kind of do it. So there is this balance between the two. Do I kind of do these videos that, you know, I may not see value in, but on the other side of it, your, your, your followers, your customers, potentially, um, they're the ones that, you know, they, they will see value in it because they want, they want you. <laughs> You're right, Aaron. That's, that's a good thing to remember because it is the personal, it is the sort of connection and feeling like you like that person. Mm, yes. I have a bunch of, you know, I have some marketing guys who I follow. I have some physiotherapist guys who I follow. And it does come down to that. Wow, I'm kind of attracted to this, this dude. I like the way he delivers. I feel that he's honest. I like his message. Let me listen to what he has to say. Yeah. And, th and that's that's going to be different for everybody who, who feels like a good fit. Yeah. Yeah. Some people are really aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> some people are very laid back. Um yeah, it, it all comes down to your personality and how you like to get your information. And there's mm -hmm. obviously a plenty to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you you've had um Adam Rafferty for for quite some time and you've been doing the online thing. Um how did that all begin in terms of what made you decide to go online and um go down that route? <sighs> You mean get a website or yeah, or yeah, 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 yeah. okay Web, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a a fun story because um, your website is quite extensive and you've got a lot of free tutorials on there and you've got a lot of resources on there uh, um I, I was checking it out last night it's a great website and i was trying to think of myself because uh, i was even looking at some of the comments that went all the way back to 2008 so you've obviously been doing it for quite some time mm -hmm. um and that journey has been extensive mm -hmm. so it when i had my little jazz wedding band uh which i'm not going to say the name of right now but it's <laughs> it's up there it's up there and you guys can figure it out if you if you look at the email address that you sent to <laughs> um but we're not gonna we're not gonna publicize that so that was that, that was pre <laughs> pre finger style uh my my partner at the time had a friend who built us our first little website coding it with you know text uh, what was the notepad on right. a pc and literally literally made five little web pages and he was the voodoo guy who knew how to get a domain name and, and find the hosting and ftp the pages up and then he also did uh, the first incarnation of AdamRafferty.com, you know, which was also just static HTML pages. And I 
and I called, this was like 96, and I called him up, and I said, dude, hey, man, I got some, I got some gigs that I need to put on my website. Can you do it, you know? And he went, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're gonna go you're gonna go to the bookstore there was actually a Barnes and Nobles bookstore which very few of them exist now he says you're gonna get yourself a fat O'Reilly book it's a, the computer publication on HTML and you're gonna learn how to do it yourself I'm not doing your your updates and turns out like most musicians you know we kind of can get nerdy with the computer stuff I really dug it yeah. Really, I, I said, wow, if I can do that, I can do this. If I can do that, I can do this. And next thing you know, I'd spend a few hours uh, screwing around with, with HTML. And then I was scuffling so bad in New York, not making enough money. Uh, my, my ex-wife had done a beautiful illustration for the wedding band site. And an old college friend who had a gig at a computer place showed – his boss, the website. So I had redone the HTML, but my, my ex did the, the illustration. And so he thought I did the whole website. Oh. And he says, man, we could use another HTML guy here. So her, her illustration kind of helped me get the gig. So I had a part-time gig in like, I would say 97, 98, 99, 20 hours a week in a computer place. And I was, you know, I had to learn Photoshop. And I, they were kind of a more of a bunch of programmers who did fancy fancy stuff to monitor phone calls for uh, financial companies like Morgan Stanley and everything. <laughs> but I had a part time gig being one of their web guys who could fix up some HTML and like clean up little buttons and put drop shadows on stuff. And you know, it's kind of like, or if they had to do a manual, I had to do screen grabs. So I was around programmers, and I had to get pretty pretty good at that stuff. So then I did the Adam Rafferty site and I moved it over to like a WordPress platform. And then I actually built the study with Adam myself with all the mechanisms of uploading. And I was just working on it a few minutes before we got on. So like, I can't fix a house, you know, everybody here where I live, like they can like fix sinks and toilets and cars. Yeah. And like, I don't know any of that. I'm a New York guy. I'd always just call the building super. Hey man, come <laughs> fix this. But like uh, with getting in there and doing a little bit of coding, it's fun. And it, it just sort of, um, I always felt like if I can't handle that myself, I'll be too beholden to somebody else to do that work for me. Now there's enough do-it-yourself websites like Wix and, and Squarespace. People can do their own sites, but it really didn't used to be that way. Right. So I, I I took the time to to learn how to do a lot of that myself. Yeah. Yeah. You have a great website. It's, it's very intuitive. Thank you. It flows well. And of oh, course, good. I can't. Can't mention the website without uh, without mentioning the, uh, your podcast, mm. um, and and you you got uh, sixteen episodes out, and I have to say I love the title of episode one. Um, oh, practicing six eight makes your four four straighter. I, that's just like that? as soon as I saw that, I was like that. Now that's perfect. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I have a bunch of episodes in the can, so to speak, because. Uh, I don't. I do them on Skype. So as as we talked about before, we went live today. They're they're here on hard drives, right in my drawer. There's a whole bunch of episodes, yeah. and I basically need the downtime to put them together and put the bumper on the front and the end, and and you know, just produce them. But I'm always trying to you know get on the phone and get with guitarists, and it's it's interesting. You know, a, a not so well known guitar player contacted me. Thomas Cor Corbu, French guy. He, I think he does stuff with looping pedal. And I, I decided that I, when he contacted me, I, I looked at his YouTube channel and he didn't have a lot of followers and a lot of views, but he was very good. And I thought, you know, this whole, this whole uh, way of things going where the, the real famous people on YouTube get astronomically more famous. Like it's like, cause they got in and then the new people can't, it's hard for them to get started. Uh, I, I thought, you know, let me let me give some people who aren't super duper famous, but but excellent. Let me let me also get them on the podcast so they can catch up a little bit and get some exposure. Yeah. So, sometimes I've felt like some of our best conversations have been with more local level 
people like in terms of digging in we've had some really good discussions because mm -hmm. sometimes when you get somebody who's got a bigger name you want to hear their story and they've got a there's a lot you want to hear from them mm -hmm. whereas a couple of our episodes with more local people have been more of a round table discussion mm -hmm. which is interesting and i think while it's not got the same clickbait appeal the mm -hmm. content of the episodes has been very high mm -hmm. high mm -hmm. quality um I understand, and and it's also easy when you're when you're well known. Uh, it's easy to put this sort of mask on that you're used to putting on in front of people. You know, if you were to if you were to see me on tour and maybe talk to me at a gig, you know, I'd be in my gig outfit, and I sort of have this way that I am with the people. It's just how I function when I'm on a gig, and that's a lot different than being relaxed and being at home and just kind of kind of rapping uh, normally it's it's easy to get into that frame of mind you know if you interview somebody really famous they're like oh they flick the switch and they're just in interview mode you know mm -hmm. so yeah it's fun to dig in and get the real the real person yeah. get the real personality yeah and so i also like to i i like to tell people uh, people often build a fantasy story i like to tell them man i I was a guitar player. I, I am a guitar player like everybody else. I was playing weddings and teaching little kids. Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> and I got incredibly lucky and popped through. And, you know, pra practiced the solo repertoire and learned how to do concerts. But, but uh, you know, I was playing restaurant gigs in New York, you know, for $80, you know, I mean, it's just $60. You know? So, yeah, I mean, we're all, we're all kind of in it trying to, trying to figure it out. We all share this incredible love of the music. It it all comes back to that. That mm -hmm. like, I just I love playing. I have I'm obsessed with playing music, and it's you know I get home from playing music all day and playing a show and walk the dog, and I'm like I want to play guitar. Good <laughs> for you. So, Good for you. I mean, I think that's what bra brings it. It's just a it's a cool community because everybody really like it may be our job, but nobody ever worked music like we play music. Right. It's called playing music because it's fun in its essence. Well, speaking of your fingerstyle guitar hangout, mm -hmm. when we started talking about doing this podcast, I started looking up other musical podcasts and mm -hmm. I wasn't really into podcasting before this. Mm -hmm. This was all Aaron's idea. Um, but I looked on something online and your guitar, your podcast came up as like one of the best that you made really? their list. It was some list of guitar oriented podcasts and i think i listened to i don't know if it was the tony mcmanus episode or something because i had been studying tony mcmanus mm -hmm. and anyway i started listening to your thing and you do you have a pitch for your study with adam website on there and it mm -hmm. it it won me it won me oh over. wow oh good it, it absolutely worked you're you know you may not be making money off the podcast exact like directly but the it definitely brings it's such a good tool to bring people in and help them find you in the first place. That's I'd that's never very... seen anything of yours. I had never seen any of your YouTube videos or anything. Oh, wow. That's really that's that's encouraging to know. Again, the guy who's my coach, uh, he has this philosophy. You would probably be able to figure out who it is if you then Google what I'm saying. He says, it's the same coach, by the way, of Scott from Scott's Bass Lessons. Oh, yeah. If you know Scott, yeah. except Scott is on, on like a more kind of elite, elite thing. I, sh I probably shouldn't say that, but you know, I, I shouldn't tell other people's business. But, but, you know, let's just say it's okay to ask experts for help. You know, just like if you're coming to me for guitar lessons, you, you go to somebody, you say, hey, what should I do? And, and this guy who's coaching me, he said, podcasts are good. Maybe write a book, which I'm kind of playing around with an idea of writing a book. I, because I, I don't only want to be on YouTube because I, I have, I've sensed that I was like way up kind of on the YouTube heap. And unless I keep on top of that, it's like the algorithm. I kind of slip under all the onslaught of the, millions of people who are just uploading every day you know mm. and 
So I'm, I'm trying to build things online where I sort of own the real estate, so to speak. You know, rather than do courses on Udemy, I do them on my own platform, uh, that kind of thing. So he, he calls it owning the race course instead of owning the race horse. You know, if you're a hot shot on YouTube, the algorithms could change and, and, and it's over. Mm -hmm. Yep. You, you've got to always, you're, you're just on their, on their turf. And of course it's important and you have to be there. <laughs> and, but I'm trying to, so that was one of the reasons with the podcast. And that was the, one of the initial ideas. And then probably like you guys find you say, well, it's work to do it, but geez, it's, it's really fun to get to know some of these folks a little bit and, 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 and get a little bit of a idea exchange going on with these great guitar players. You know, it's, it's, uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying doing it. And we just rap for an hour. I kind of have a set of questions that I haven't really known if it was cool for people to listen to, but I guess people are interesting. And if you get to know a new guitar player, it's, it's, hopefully interesting you know? uh, yeah i just listened to your andre valeri episode uh -huh. and i pulled up his mediterraneo album and i think i've listened to it twice this week while i was cooking and it's like i really like his playing and i would have never found him and mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's i think uh petteri seriosa seriola that Seriola. Guy. he's both those awesome. guys are two of my favorites oh petteri i i did a gig with um the three of us did an acoustic guitar night, me, Don Ross, and Pettery. Oh. And Don Ross and I were standing there with our mouths hanging open watching Pettery. <laughs> Man, he unplugged his guitar and walked out into the audience, and he's playing drums on it. No mic, no nothing, and he's singing. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, you too. And he gets up on a chair in the middle of this concert hall, in Germany, you know, where everybody's prim and proper, and he is just bringing the house down. Pettery, boy, he is really special. He is really special. But, you know, geez, I mean, everybody's special when you get into the thing that they do. Yeah. Everybody has their their thing, you know. And uh, Andrea is incredible. I mean, he's... Very Tommy Emmanuel in his, to me... Like he, yeah, and I mean that in a positive way. He's yeah, some they're, of his they're... tunes and the way that flows reminds me of Tommy's albums and playing. He has a lot of really similar strong points that Tommy has. Yeah, Andrea is really cool. Andrea is cool. They're all cool. Yeah, I got a bunch of interviews in the can. I got to get out. I got Muriel Anderson and Michael Fix and a whole bunch of people. Whole bunch yeah. Of people. Look forward to seeing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Listening. Yeah. Um, so another thing for mm -hmm. me, what has drawn me to you is like I, I grew up, I was like, I grew up in North Carolina and there's all this like bluegrass and folk music, but I kind mm -hmm. of gravitated toward some more the sounds of southern rock and blues, mm -hmm. Stevie Ray Vaughan and the Allman brothers and things mm -hmm. like that. I moved up to Washington, DC, and I was playing in kind of a funk rock band and then ended up getting more and more into music and Aaron turned me on to guys like Paul Gilbert and Satriani and mm -hmm. I started going more that direction then I I got into jazz and I like kind of dove in a hundred percent and went full jazz for several years and then like I've been in I've been playing solo in Virginia Beach uh -huh. and I use a looping pedal and mm -hmm. I play these i play some jazz standards and stuff but i saw a couple guys there are a couple local guys one's been on the podcast and one's actually on tomorrow mm -hmm. um so dustin furlow and a guy named matt thomas who's coming on tomorrow mm -hmm. they just go out there with an acoustic guitar and it's phenomenal sounding all just you know like you know it's modern acoustic finger style guitar and i hadn't really seen a lot of that i wasn't really savvy to mm -hmm. the world of Andy McKee and Tommy Emanuel and mm -hmm. that. Um, but what I like about what you do is your arranging is you are able to keep the bass line going while playing the melody, which I there's not a whole lot of people who do exactly what you do. And it really, I mean, it it's a huge, huge difference be, 
between just playing like a root and fifth kind of bass line, you're actually playing like your arrangement of Billy Jean. You're actually playing the bass line and you managed to grab those melody notes. Did did you I've le- I've I've since left some bass notes out to make things easier, but thank <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess my it's kind of a multi-part question, but like mm-hmm. did you have someone that already did that or did you already do that in more of a jazz style? I mean, I I play so chord style jazz too, but mm-hmm. it's not quite the same as these you know, where you're just grabbing the bass and the melody and kind of sticking in the the harmony notes in the middle where you can, but did you have a template when you started doing I Wish? Well, something like I Wish is a little bit more complicated than some other songs because there's so much movement in the bass and so much movement in in the melody at the same time. I would say the template for I Wish was the Bach Bure in E minor. You know that ba 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 ba. You know that you know that classical guitar piece. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I could I could play I could I could play a minute of it, but that that that's kind of a freakish piece where the template, how I saw that it could happen, would be like a, a classical guitar thing. But as far as what I would call, and Billy Jean's kind of a freakish piece, and that's undergone a lot of changes uh, since the original YouTube video. It sounds, it flows way better now. Uh, there's less notes, but the, the flow is better. Um, but I would say mo- the most of my pieces, like the, the sort of meat and potatoes, like Mas Kinata, uh, all those Beatles tunes, Stevie Wonder tunes, you see, when I studied with Longo, he, he's like a master arranger, not, not just a piano player. I mean, this guy was writing big band charts for like Buddy Rich's big band, for Dizzy Gillespie's big band. You know, he, he was an arranging maestro, you know, and, and then his own big band. I mean, he's, you know, and so I studied writing four part harmony with him, which is like the absolutely correct Bach way to write four voice voice leading. So you're ab- you have these handcuffs on in terms of what you can play and what you can't play okay. or what you can write and what you can't write. Mm-hmm. You really have to obey rules. And if you've gone to music school, Joe, or you know, I don't know if you guys studied that to what degree you studied it, but it's called, you know, there's voice leading. So that's step one. And then I went and studied counterpoint. I studied with Mike and then I studied with another guy and I, I did all the preliminary exercises, and then I think the book is here. I studied from the, the a book called Gratis Ad Parnassum. It's actually the little book. You can get it on Amazon by Johann Fuchs. Mozart also studied out of that book, apparently, and it's all these little counterpoint exercises. And I never, like, did it to completion with any teacher, but, I, you know, I wrote a couple fugues that, that sounded good from beginning to end and a couple two-part inventions. So what happens is – I know I'm giving you kind of a long answer, Joe, but what happens what is wanted, it's perfect. You, you get a mental picture. You get a mental picture of what an arrangement has to look like, and then – playing in so many jazz groups, I was like, oh, well, the bass guy over here is playing a bass line, either horn or singer or somebody over there is doing the melody. What am I going to do? I'm going to do little two-note comp voicings with thirds and sevens. So all in all, that's like you could you could say four voices, or you could say it's a, a bottom, a top, and a middle. And so that basic formula of a bottom, or I should say a top, meaning a melody, a top, bottom, and middle, that's like a really sort of broad formula, but that's that's where you start. So when I'm thinking, when it's something as complicated as I wish, I'm just thinking top and bottom. I'm, I'm not thinking middle. But for any of the other pieces, it's top, middle, and bottom. And, you know, you have to, you have to become trained to go, wait a minute, I can't just let the bottom fall out and do nothing or like what's going on down there. And, you know, all the lines should basically be 
unbroken. You know, you don't want to go like ding, 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 da, da, da. You know, like you can kind of hear a break in a melody line or if it just stops. So Bach, when he taught people, he was stone cold serious about the, the continuity of lines going horizontally through music. And he would actually kind of dog on all the piano players who played these big chords and, and just made as much volume as possible. He would refer to them as the knights of the piano, like sarcastically, you know, like these knights, these tough guys who were doing these idiotic chords, all of a sudden 10 voices coming out of nowhere. And so now that, that's not necessarily wrong because the music we now play Sometimes you want that sound of like a strum that would be like a 12 string guitar and it doesn't need to connect, you know, to everything else in the piece. But that was so planted in my subconscious and in, in the way that I see things that that's just how the arrangements are built. So I'm visualizing like that. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, everybody has an opinion. When I hear all the, quote, modern fingerstyle guys who are only doing percussion and harmonics and all that stuff, I'm like, it's cool sound effects, but it has nothing to do with top, middle, and bottom. You know, that's music that, like, it's cool. Like, if you heard some dudes on the street playing conga drums, like, that's, that's cool. There's a sound to it, but that's pretty easy because you, there's no constraints on having to have a singable melody, having to have a bass line with continuity. And so I'm, I'm pretty tough on myself about that. Things, things need to make sense. They need to, they need to hang together. So I, I started putting those arrangements together myself on, on acoustic guitar, you know? And if you start with good material, the arrangements kind of fall into place. Like if you're doing a tune like Overjoyed by Stevie Wonder, all you need is the melody and a few bass notes and your arrangement is there, you know? So I don't know if that explains it. I never had anybody show me how to do that on the guitar, but I knew on music paper and sonically what it had to, what it had to look like. Yeah. Well, it, it's awesome. I, I really, oh, geez, like I had tried to create, like I'll do Misty or mm -hmm. jazz chord style, but I'm just mm -hmm. not, I know one of my weaknesses is like, I can't, I'm not great at the whole Joe pass thing. Like I can't walk the bass notes that well. It's just not a strength of mine, but I can, you know, I can, I'm pretty good at grabbing the chords and getting the melody on top. And mm -hmm. so it sounds great when I'm playing in the context of a band, the way I do mm -hmm. something like Misty or all the things you are, but it mm -hmm. tends to on acoustic guitar by itself. It's, it's lacking. So like learning your version of Misty is, far better than what I had come up with for acoustic guitar. When I do stuff that has a, a real independent bass line like Misty, I'll only, I'll do that for a, a section or maybe for four bars. Because if you stay on that for too long, it sounds like too much like a skeleton. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of, plant that sound in the listener's ear for maybe four bars, but then I'll go into some chord voicings to say, ah, there's also some meat on the bones. So you, you don't need to have it all, all throughout. You know, like I said, when I played, I wish, and I did it all like a two part thing. It's, it just sounded like an exercise. And like I, I, yeah. The chorus of Billie Jean, you get <laughs> it. It gets, it's such a relief for the hand to, when you get to the chorus, yeah. it just goes to like some, you know, just the chords. Right. No more walking right. bass. Right. <laughs> yeah. And another thing that informs the arrangements, and this is something that only, ex I think only one's experience, well, you get this from experience and you'll, you'll know this, Joe. Uh, you can have great ideas about your arrangements, but it's when you're playing at a high volume through a PA system and then all of a sudden you're hearing every little click and scrape and every unintentional open string that's when you sort of have to uh through through being in that environment enough the the arrangements sort of 
adapt themselves to, to being concert level. Th th there's a difference between that bedroom level, I can play it perfectly, and then I'm plugged into a PA system and everything's loud. And, and your hands, you, you start to learn how to adapt it to, to a louder situation. We were just talking about that last, our last episode was with mm -hmm. Blake Weiland of the Tone Mob podcast, and he's on Chasing mm -hmm. Tone with uh, Brian Wampler of Wampler Effects. But anyway, uh -huh. we, we really got it. We were talking about, you know, the way you run your pedal setup and your amp, depending on your amp volume, you know, you can have bedroom volume, getting your drive all from your pedals versus on stage, you can actually turn up your amp and you can use far less pedal distortion if you're, uh, doing, if you're doing like rock and uh -huh. lead guitar sounds and that sort of thing but it does acoustic guitar it's tremendously different when you plug in i everything's so different the the percussive sounds all sound different mm -hmm. and that is where we're going to end it for this week's episode of fret buzz the podcast be sure to join us next Thursday for part two with Adam Rafferty. And don't forget to check out adamrafferty.com and studywithadam.com. As always, thank you for listening. Uh, it means a whole lot. Also, as usual, head on over to all the socials, subscribe, like, head on over to iTunes, give us a review if you really enjoy our material. It helps us a lot. And if you like, you can head on over to patreon.com and see all the different ways that you can support Brett Buzz, the podcast. And don't forget, if you are listening to this on podcast, that we also have a YouTube channel available and vice versa. If you are listening to this on YouTube, you always have the option of catching Fret Buzz the podcast on any one of the many podcasting apps on both iOS and Android. So with all that being said, thank you again for listening join us next thursday for part two with adam rafferty on fret buzz the podcast <laughs>